Hello, Ninja Riders. Welcome to episode one of the Serial Killers. <laughs> we are killing it with serial fiction, or we're trying to, because none of us have written serial fiction before. So we are um, inviting you to join us from the very beginning as the five of us um, work toward learning how to write and publish and market serialized fiction. Serialized fiction is fiction that is episodic like the TV show. That's how we are so describing it for ourselves or def defining it for ourselves, I think. So I'm Shanta Grimes. I am the owner of Ninja Writers. I am a, a novelist and a blogger and a um, general writer. I write a lot every day um, and I teach a lot every day and I love my work and I'm very excited to be here and I'm gonna introduce you to the rest of the Serial Killer crew. Adrian is my daughter and she's here. Hi, Adrian. Hi, um, I'm Adrian. Uh, I am a newer fiction writer and um, I recently finished my first draft of a fiction novel um, and now I am revising it slash slightly rewriting it <laughs> and turning it into a serial fiction uh, story that um, I think I'm going to try self-publishing on Substack piece by piece and then hopefully Amazon once it's all and done. what kind of like do you want to tell us a little bit about your story sure um so it's a like older YA some sort of fantasy I can't decide if it would be considered urban fantasy or paranormal fantasy um but it's uh, about a girl who learns that she can um that she's a reader which in in this world is uh somebody who can read minds and she meets um her guide and uh kind of like a Giles and Buffy Summers relationship but without the age gap and also without the mentorship a guide is not really a mentor more like a partner he's like a buffer yeah a buffer um I it is just kind of about mostly about birdie but about also just this dynamic in this world where like readers and guides exist nice thank you adrian hi lee carter from wales is here hi. lee is a long time ninja writer one of my favorite people hi lee hi um so yeah i'm a fiction writer i also blog um, I've just finished a fiction YA story, which I am in editing for at the moment. Um, my serial fiction is called Five Ghosts, and it is a dystopian um, sci-fi YA about a world where the main characters are all microchipped at the age of 14 and mm. controlled by this evil corporation. Oh, you're writing dystopian, like a yes. dystopian ghost story. Is there ghosts or not? No, no ghosts. Oh, I'm <laughs> just in the title. Yeah, it's a play on the um, 5G conspiracy theory. Oh, very interesting. Thank you, Lee. And then Terry Demons is here. And Terry is actually, I think, writing a ghost story. I am, yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Terry. Uh, I am a fiction writer. I've been writing since I was very little, which means a really long time. Um, I have a lot of stories that live in my head. Um, I've mm -hmm. never, I'm still, you know, trying to get my whole career as a writer going, and I believe that that's going to happen. I like to write um, middle grade fiction. I love YA fiction, steampunk, fantasy, um, all kinds of things. But for my serial fiction, I'm going to be writing um, 
a story called Paranormal Times. I have a series of ghost stories that I've written in the past and it centers around a paranormal, a young paranormal um, ghost hunting group. And so she's going to be part of this. Uh, but the, the tagline here that I have is the story of a girl who loses her family and has to move in with an aunt she doesn't know, start partway through her junior year in a school she doesn't know and try to find her way. On top of that, her house may be haunted. She may be haunted. So it's um, a story centered around her becoming part of a paranormal group, but also the story of her family and the fact that she um, may be more paranormal than she thinks. Mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you, Terry. And Zach Payne is here. Zach has been um, like my right hand man at Ninja Rider since the very, 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 very beginning. And he is a beautiful writer and I'm super excited he's doing this project with us. Hi, Zach. Hello, hi everybody, I'm Zach Payne. I am a poet and novelist. And for this project, I will be working on something completely different from my usual. It will be a high fantasy CSI kind of idea revolving around the, a daughter of a disgraced family working with the Queen's Guard trying to solve murders and other issues in their kingdom. Nice. Is it, is it paranormal or just um, high fan like set in a fantasy world? Just set in a fantasy world. Nice. Awesome. Um, I forgot to tell you about my story, which is um, a, a Robin Hood retelling. I actually have written the novel and I love it and I've struggled to sell it. And um, actually in the process of, edit, of um, serializing it, I've, I've learned a lot about why it's not quite working, but it's a modern day Robin Hood story set in Las Vegas, which is my hometown and where Adrian was born. And um, in real life, there's a series of storm drains underneath the Las Vegas Strip where homeless people live. And so the storm drains are going to be um, the like Sherwood Forest in my story. And um, so modern day Las Vegas Robin Hood retelling. <laughs> That's my story. It's called The Undergrounders and I'm very excited. So um, Full disclosure, this is the first time that we are meeting. Um, we are inviting you guys along like straight from the beginning. So it might take a couple of episodes of the serial killers to find our flow, but I'm confident that we will. Um, so for right now, our plan is to spend a few minutes, do like an accountability, talk about how we're doing, um, what we're planning on doing, where, you know, any problems any of us are having, so that maybe you're having the same problems or questions about serialized fiction yourself. And um, then Terry is going to be in the hot seat this first week, and she's going to read some of her work. And then I am going to screen share and live edit for her um, in the hopes that she will, um, in the hopes that, uh, that will help her to edit her rest of her stories going forward. And also I want you guys to see how useful and helpful it can be to see someone else be edited. Sometimes it's when you're a little removed from your, from the work that's being done, it's a lot easier to see um, how it applies to your own work because you're not feeling defensive or like, um, oh, that might work for everyone else, but it won't work for me because my story is special or whatever. So um, that, that's the plan. We're going to try that today. Um, our, we're going to try pretty hard to keep this whole call to one hour. We'll see how we do with that. So what are we working on guys? What are, does anybody have any questions? Like, how did you guys do this week for working on your, I can start. Okay. Um, so I am, um, working on so I, I finished my this for the first draft of this book in during Nan, NaNoWriMo but I've been working on it for about a, a year before that um kind of mm -hmm. often. and um it was I mean it's the first fiction project that I've I've finished from 
you know, start to finish. And there, there was definitely still like scenes and stuff that still needed to be written. Um, but I don't know. I, it had, I was, uh, I don't know. I, I think that this is a story that would work well for, for like an episodic or serial type fiction. Cause it, it centers, um, pretty strongly on one character um and that what I'm told is is a good thing for serial fiction and um I don't know I I was working on Shanta had created a worksheet which maybe we can share with the recording for this down below on on how to write and plot a uh, or how to plot not how to write but how to plot a, a serial fiction like episode And it made me realize as I was going through that to see like, okay, well, this could be easy because I could see where in my drafts that I already have, there's like some natural breaking points already. And, you know, that I could definitely at least split it up into like six episodes, Um, Mm -hmm. which I think is, I still feel pretty confident that like what I have is, is like really good strong bones for for an episodic fiction like I can see still like okay well you know once I get up to this scene that's already written like that's the end of episode one you know that's the end of episode two and and so forth um but filling out that worksheet made me realize that I did not have um I did not have a really strong antagonist my antagonist is kind of like I don't know it's almost like I guess I wasn't thinking about my antagonist in the way that I should, but also, you know, like it was not the character that I thought I would. So I did have an antagonist, but I wasn't writing her as an antagonist. And also the antagonist that I thought I had had more of like a Scooby-Doo-esque ending. <laughs> where it's just like they pull off the mask at the end and that's it. And um, it just was not very strong. And that was, a uh, it got me into rethinking the plot that I have and not really rethinking the plot because I think that the plot in general is still there. Um, like my five key plot points aren't changing all that much or or anything along those lines um, from what I already have, but I have had to add in, I've added in a whole new character and mm-hmm. bammed up another new character, you know, another character that was already there. Um, and also a lot of what I'm doing is like, you know, I have, uh, exploring these kind of supernatural creatures, people, and, um, I didn't do a lot of explaining of how that all worked, like how their world works. And yeah, I'm needing, uh, that's a lot of what I'm going back in and, and adding, adding in. Um, and I don't know. I, I just wrote, my first like new scene for this book since finishing it and um it's like a brand new opening for it and I'm kind of excited about it and I'm already reworking it when I probably should just write forward but I really want to get like the tone captured in this first like opening scene Mm -hmm. forward so I will move forward after this but I rewrote it as like um for in first person and I'm liking it a lot more and I'm getting, I'm really liking that I get to, to like capture the character because it's a, the scene is from the point of view of a character who like throughout the rest of the book, we only ever get to um, like hear from in like diary entries. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I, you know, this is the only, uh, what I imagine is like the only chapter where we get to really be in her point of view. And so, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I want to make sure I'm getting it right. And so I think, I don't know. That's where I, where I am. I don't know. Good job though. That I, I, I'm I've heard a lot of this story already and I've worked with Adrian. Um, I mean, she's my daughter. So as you can imagine, we spent a lot of time together and um, I've heard a lot of her the last year as she's written her first novel and it's been very exciting for me, but um I um she's also in the academy workshop um that I run so she get you know I I get to give her feedback or hear and hear other people's feedback and anyway it's a very good story and I'm very excited about it when do you plan on publishing 
I, I would, I think ideally, and this is hoping that like, I, I would like to have like a, a, maybe a published date of March 1st. <laughs> And I'm hoping I, I'm I'm trying to see like I'm spending more time really figuring out how to write this first episode and like not you know letting it just take as long as it takes because I'm figuring out how to write in this this style too. No, um, yeah, and then I'm hoping it'll go go faster. But um, there I'm I'm having to I, I'm a, a little worried that I'm having to add in too much to have like a realistic published date of, of, of I, definitely I could publish episode one on March 1st, but I feel like I would like to have like at least the rough drafts of all the other episodes. Mm -hmm. the, one thing that has occurred to me is um, like consistency will matter the most, like mm -hmm. making sure that if you do tell people, your readers, like I'm gonna have an episode every week or every other week or once a month or whatever, that you actually can do yeah. that. I think that for all of us, that's I, gonna be. Yeah, I have this like idea of, I think it would be really cool to treat it like like a TV show, you know? Like it would be, mm -hmm. I would like to have like a day of the week and a time that's like, come back this time to see episode two. Um, but I think in order to do that, I'd have to have. So that if you have six episodes, that would put your entire um, series out in six weeks. Yeah. Um, which is like what it is. But how long are your episodes going to be, do you think? Um, I think maybe 20 to 40 pages. Okay. I think, I'm guessing. I'm trying to imagine like how much I have already written yeah I think well, I think 20 to 40 maybe was there um any like I don't know anything your serial killer crew can help you with I don't know um I don't know like what's a what's a I'd be interested in hearing like how often everybody else planned on publishing I know that you yeah, said one month for yours and I, I like every month and I want like to me I wonder if that's like not if there, that's too much of a gap between it. Like what's the- I think we will find out. I think one reason why it's cool to have five of us is because we can each do something different. Like we're all gonna be not doing the exact same thing. We're starting in the same place, but we're gonna do, you know, uh, my plan is eight episodes that kind of coincide with the eight sequences in the novel. And um, I, I physically don't have the time to do more than one episode a month. So um, like, this is what, even if it's too far apart, like I don't, I can't do it any faster than that. Um, my alternative would be to take a long time to finish the whole thing and then release them more quickly, which maybe next year that would be like, if this doesn't work, I might try that again with a different story or something. Mm -hmm. um, but like, this is what I can do lee what what is your plan for um publishing um well i'm planning 12 episodes mm -hmm. um, but this is just season one and every pretty much every episode i think is going to end on a cliffhanger um so my schedule for it is to write the episode by the 15th of every month and then edit to publish on the last day of the month. So one, so 12 episodes, one a month? Yeah. And Adrian's planning on publishing on Substack, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm planning on, well, I'll talk about my flow in a minute, but I'm curious where you're planning on putting your work on Substack or? I'm not sure yet. Um, originally, I thought Amazon, um, the issue there being trying to sort out a cover. Mm -hmm. You probably want so, a cover regardless. But it's sort of trying to work out there those practicalities. Covers, you know, they, like that you can buy for not too much money. I've seen them for mm. as little as like $25. You could go yeah. um, also on... Um, um, I noticed that 
uh, creative market had a lot of really nice ones that the problem there would be that I don't, you know, whether or not it would be unique and that somebody else would use it, you know, that's, that's the mm -hmm. case there, but I but don't But if you know. get one that's got all the elements, you can go in and change things, I think. Also, you know, you can always update a cover later down the line too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting hearing you talk about your sort of planning process, Adrian, because mine is somewhat different to you because the five in the title is actually the five main characters that I have hmm. and what I found with plotting I had to do it in a different way because I had those different characters so they've each got their five key plot points and I had to work out a way to bring them all together mm -hmm. um, which was challenging but it was also quite fun to do um, yeah. So at the moment, I've got about... How long will your episodes be? Do you know? Um, first episode, I'm looking at about 13,000. So that they're going to be in the 13 to 15,000 word range. Okay. And you're going to publish the first one before you've written the second one? Yeah. So you're fairly calm. You haven't done any writing on the second one? No. And But you're pretty confident that you can write fast enough to get um, 13,000 words written in two weeks? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Carrie, what's your plan? Well, um, I am planning to, I, I am at this point, I am planning um, 10 episodes. And they're probably going to hover somewhere between six and 10,000 words. I'll, I'll know more once I get going. Um, my goal for this week, I have, I have part of the first two episodes finished right now, just because I wanted to get a feel of the whole story. Because although I know these characters and I've written these paranormal stories, I've never tried to take them and put them in a plot, if, if that makes sense, to give them mm -hmm. a whole backstory. Um, so my goal for this week is to get all 10 episodes plotted. So that I at least know where I'm going. Because where I usually fall is I, I just start going and I'm so excited in the beginning and I don't pay attention to plotting and then I just totally run out of steam towards the middle, which I think is pretty common. So this time I'm going to be very careful and very systematic and get everything plotted out so that I know what I'm heading for. Um, and then I can fit in the ghost stories wherever they fit. Terry, did you know that today, this is, we're recording this on Sunday, January 9th and um, and while the Ninja Ride Along is having a special three hour call where we're going to do um, how to test and develop a story idea together and zero drafting. Really? <laughs> At three o'clock. Just saying. All right. You be that in I'm, in it. <laughs> I'm going, I'm excited. <laughs> that sounds like fun. <laughs> Yeah, I um, and I think I think I'm going to be trying to um, publish these episodes every two weeks. Oh, that's a, okay. And then so I'm planning. You have, a, you're going to have to write one every other week, or you have a bunch. You're going to have be ahead. Well, I'm a little bit ahead because I um, I have these ghost stories already written, and they're going to fit in to the plot in different places. So I'm not going to be half. I'm not going to have to write a fresh episode every two weeks it's more going to be like I'm writing the filler in around it to connect everything together if that makes mm -hmm. sense but um I'm really bad at procrastinating and I know that I could be much more productive if I actually had a goal a deadline and a reason to produce so I'm not worried about getting it done okay cool she said <laughs> <laughs> with confidence yes <laughs> So we have somebody, two people who public, plan to publish monthly and one person every other week. So I think weekly. I would really like to publish. I think I would really like to do weekly. And I think even if it means that, like, I think that my, if I'm going to do that, like, I think I really do need to have them all written before I hit publish. Right. And, and I think that that, even if that means that I don't publish until like, April or whatever like I have to we but I, I like the idea I like the idea of having so I don't know I first envisioned it as six episodes and it might be closer to 10 now because I'm add, having to add in um you know a, a plot line and so that adds bulk into it but I 
I like the idea that like I can kind of just push through with the publishing part for like publishing once a week for six to 10 weeks and then have like a break, you know, like TV shows shows do where I like go to write the next, you know. Yeah, that's what I was I gonna don't say. If you had yeah. six episodes um and you were gonna publish them weekly, you could have a quarterly season. Um, so that would give you there's 12 mm-hmm. weeks in a season. So that would give you six weeks to, to work on the next um, season. I think, yeah. I think my plan this year is to have, cause I, it, I have my whole writing plan right now and all the books I'm going to write this year. Um, they, I have a schedule for all of them. And so I will have two seasons written this year. So I think that I'm, I'm this year, I'm just going to do it like not quarterly, but I think. Twice half? a year. Yeah, twice a year. So I'll have like a, I think so. Yeah, but I think I'm just going to let myself like instead of pushing myself to, to, um, I don't know if I'm not ready, if I don't have all the, the episodes written by March 1st, then I'm just going to have to push it back because I think if that's the most important thing is that I have mm-hmm. them done. Right. Right. Zach, what's your plan? So I would like to start publishing by March at least, I'd like to do a story a month about 10 to 15,000 words, or I should say an episode a month, 10 to 15,000 words. And I am still trying to decide where I want to publish originally. I, we've talked before about, we've mentioned Substack, we've also talked before about Tumblr, and I think mm-hmm. that might be an interesting way to uh, get people interested, especially because mine is going to have more of a uh, YA bent to it. Mm -hmm. So I think that audience is there. But I would ultimately like to publish it on Amazon as well once I have a good series together. Uh, Well, Adrienne did some research, which is what led to this. She saw, what's her name? L. L. Griffin. L. Griffin. Um, who is she had a flow that was interesting to Adrienne, which is what got us talking about this, where she is publishing Substack first, and then in a month she's publishing. So her paid Substack subscribers get the story a month ahead, and then she's publishing to Medium for free. And then her goal is to put them all together into a novel. She's not serializing though, she's just doing chapters of a novel, which is not the same thing. Um, we are taking that and like giving it our own twist, right? Cause we're all working on serializing versus just ch- publishing a novel, a chapter at a time. Um, but having a flow is what's really interesting to me of where that, how you can um, start to gather some audience before you have your whole season of your serial fiction finished is really interesting. And I think what I'm gonna do Um, So we're all also in different places. So I already have a presence on Amazon. Like I already have some fiction audience because I'm traditionally published already. So my thought was that I might experiment with having a sub staff that's like maybe $1.99 a month or whatever and publishing my episode to those people first. So my goal is to publish the first episode on February 27th. So the, um, the end of the month, next month, though, <laughs> I'm not ready. Um, so next month. And um, then in 30 days, putting it up on, so like on March, whatever my date is in March, I, I, I have it in my, I am so on top of my editorial planning this season, you guys. But so on March 27th um, is, would be my episode two would go out to Substack and I can then publish episode one to Amazon. So the, the benefit to publishing, to joining my Substack would be that um, for one thing, for $1.99, you could get all of the episodes, you know, that I've already published for free, um, not for free, but for $1.99. Plus you would get the next episode a whole month earlier than everyone else. Um, so that is so and then publishing like an omnibus which would be like the undergrounders episode or season one and um i think that's going to be my flow i don't think i'm going to put mine on medium for free the problem with putting something on medium for free is that it is then published and it can become hard to put your book on amazon's um um 
Kindle Unlimited, which I think is kind of important for fiction because I, I think that's where readers are when you're an unknown or when you don't have like, I, you know, I don't have an, I have some audience, but my mostly write middle grade and this is a different kind of story. And it's definitely important for if you're writing short stories or like mm -hmm. um, episodic, right? Because people are more willing to take a chance and on a shorter thing that I don't know, they're paying money because they paid for Kindle Unlimited, but it, you know, it's different than going and just buying the episode. Well, then I, I thought I could have, when I do the whole season, I might um, like to have, try to have anyway, a, um, like a paperback. So you could buy the paperback version of the entire season to have. And um, I also think I, Zach, that, when Zach does yeah. his poetry books, you can email him and he'll send you like a signed um, card like a signed sticker. And I thought I could do something like that for people who buy the whole omnibus um, as a paperback. So I, I, that's gonna be my flow and I'm gonna have eight seasons. And um, if I start in February and then I, I think that by the end of the year, so maybe in time for Christmas, I would have the entire, like someone could buy the book as a Christmas gift. Um, that's my goal. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Has your okay. story been easy to like, um, um, well, do you, um, I'm definitely going to share the, the, um, worksheet that I did send it to you guys. The five of us have it, but I'm going to share it. I don't know if it worked, if it helped anyone else, but I know it helped Adrian and it helped me a lot. Um, because I was struggling with like, why I wrote this book. It's a great idea. I'm very confident about it. And I'm, I'm a good writer, I think. So I like, why is it not connecting? And I realized after doing that um, serialized fiction that I had rushed the front of it way too much, like way, way, way too much. And um, it's because I, I know Robin Hood so well that I was trying to like shoehorn it into a classic story and it needed, like I needed to like let it slow down. And I think it's actually um, like, ready-made for serialized um, fiction because in serialized like in a serial you can slow down and you each episode like you don't need to hurry up to get to the each um and each part can be like more unfolded so similar to how like the hobbit is a short little book but like when they serialized it into three movies like each one could be um blossomed open you know what however you feel about the movies I really like them but I know some people don't but like regardless like they could each one could be bigger and explore more because um it doesn't have to hurry up and get to the next part mm -hmm. all right are we ready for Terry's reading I'm going to um here's what I'm going to do I'm going to make myself a spotlight for me and then I'm going to screen I'm going to open Terry's <laughs> thing her chapter and then I'm going to screen share so we can read along with her and you guys can um at home you know who, wherever you're watching this can um can read along as she reads and then we're going to give our feedback and then I am going to edit right here with you live Terry when you're ready okay um so this is the beginning of paranormal times. Again, it's the story of a girl who loses her family and has to move in with an aunt she doesn't know, start partway through her junior year in a school she doesn't know, and try to find her way. On top of that, her house may be haunted. She may be haunted. <clears throat> they say that some ghosts live in houses. I say they can live inside of you, holding tight to your bones and squeezing your heart at the most inopportune times. And the problem is, no matter how you try to move on, how you try to ignore the sadness, there's a part of your soul that squeezes back. We're here. Aunt Ivy's voice pulls me up out of my well of despair and back into the tired old minivan that is delivering me to yet another place to stay. I haven't been home in a year. There hasn't been a home for me to go to for a year. Well, Aunt Ivy and Uncle Walt tried, I suppose, but their house is small and their overachieving kids take up a lot of air. I take a breath and look out the window into a dreary cloud covered evening. The sun has given up and sunk behind the trees, even though it's not quite supper time. I know how it feels. I'm a 16 year old girl who has totally given up on finding normal ever again. We bounce up a long gravel driveway framed by, a giant, green, by giant green pines and wispy birch and ash trees whose colorful leaves are already dead on the ground. 
At the crest of the hill, the trees open up onto an expanse of greenish brown grass dotted with boulders and what might be bird feeding stations. I can't see much in the failing light. Beyond is a monster of a Victorian mansion, the kind with steep, steep gabled roofs, towers and balconies, a rounded front porch, all decorated with stained glass and woodwork you might find on a gingerbread house at Christmas. I know this house, not that I've ever been here. Morgan Manor is where my mother grew up with her sisters and their mother before them, and right on back, traceable to shortly after the founding of Freeport itself in 1789. A sea captain named Morgan Sterling built it as a gift for his new bride. I don't know why they called the place Morgan Manor and not Sterling Manor. Maybe the captain was possessive and didn't want any of his family to be able to lay claim to it. Not that it matters. He died a year later, a year after it was built, and then his wife died of a broken heart. My great great whatever great grandparents bought it for a song and kept it in the family ever since. In 1999, everything fell apart, the year my grandmother and grandfather died, the year my mother and her sisters decided they would rather split up and stop being a family instead of trying to talk out their differences. We moved to Vermont. Aunt Ivy moved to Pownall. Aunt Aggie stayed in the manor. I lost an entire side of my heritage. My mind clears of the driving fuzz as the minivan pulls to a stop, bothered by, the, by sudden silly fear. I haven't ever spoken to my aunt. I haven't even met her. What if I'm not welcome? as if I care. Still, my voice sounds childish when I say, are you sure Aunt Aggie doesn't mind my coming to stay? I wait for Aunt Ivy to make me feel better. Of course, she's happy to have you, your family, right? But instead, she clears her throat and shrugs. It doesn't matter, hon, the court's ordered it. I bite back a sigh and try to find the positive. Do you have your bag? Oops. Yes. I clutch the green canvas messenger bag like it's a lifeline. Oh, I just lost my place. It's faded and torn on one seam with an ACDC patch covering another rip on the front. It was my dad's. Aunt Ivy takes a breath and holds it for a second as if stealing herself for this next bit. Then she exhales and turns off the van at the same time. Okay, let's go. The stairs creak as we climb. Alternating wind chimes and hanging planters full of dead flowers sway back and forth in the warm yellow glow of the porch light. Aunt Ivy again pauses, her hand, her hand raised, before grabbing the brass knocker and banging three times. We wait. After what seems like forever, I count the peeps of some lone bug or frog out in the woods. The door opens when I reach 13, to reveal an older woman with shoulder-length white hair, wearing a pair of ripped jeans and a loose top colored in blue, green, and purple swirls. The wooden screen door whines as she pushes it open to lean against the door frame. She looks Ivy up and down. You got old, she says gruffly. Ivy stiffens. You'll always be older. They square off for a moment like stray dogs, and I wonder if I should step back or get trampled in the fight. But Aggie's face suddenly softens into a smile that deepens the creases by her eyes. She steps forward and hugs Ivy. Long time no see, sis. Ivy returns the embrace, gripping tightly, before stepping back and holding up one hand towards me, like I'm what she brought for show and tell. She sniffs, her eyes suddenly bright. Well, and here's Corey. Aunt Aggie turns her sea green eyes to me, looking me over from my whip straight brown hair down to my worn high top Nikes. Her expression is almost hungry as it settles back on my face. I want to reach up and see if I have something stuck there. You look just like your mother. Thanks, I reply lamely, like I had anything to do with how I look. Come on in. The moving company delivered your luggage earlier. It's in your room. I follow her. Ivy hesitates on the doorstep. Aggie turns. You won't come in for a minute? Ivy looks away. I... I can't. Wait, Walt and the kids are expecting me for supper. Okay. Is that disappointment in their voices? Now that's odd, considering the family has been fighting for years. Can I talk to you out here before I go? Aunt Aggie nods and ushers me inside. Corey, go on in. The kitchen is down the hall. There are some cookies on the counter. She pulls the screen door closed between us and turns away. Instead of going to find cookies, I linger in the foyer and eavesdrop shamelessly. I don't hear much. Just snatches of a whispered conversation. Not a good idea. Already senses it. Can't be sure. And one sharp retort from Aunt Aggie. I won't let it. There's silence for a moment, then a flurry of motion. I pull my messenger bag over my shoulder and hurry down a hallway lined in pictures hung, in dark blue, hung on dark blue wallpaper, decorated with swirling flower vines and birds. Better get to the kitchen before they realize I'm listening. Oh, well, thank That's you. It. I'm going to... Now I need to... Re Remove my spotlight. Okay, who has feedback for Terry? That was so fun. 
Terry is one of the best descriptive writers that I know, especially with setting or scene, like setting. And I don't know what it is, Terry, but you write woods especially well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, think I grew up in them. <laughs> Yeah. I know. I think, it's, I think it's because she's a main person, and Maine is full of woods. I think. Oh, yeah. You when you oh, this opening of of you know uh, just opening into the woods. I I felt like this was going to be um, more fantasy than paranormal. Like <laughs> I felt like it was a setting for another world. The way that you described it, which I don't think is mm-hmm. a bad thing. I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Very. Um, I, I do have a comment though on a place in here where I felt like the, that you were so beautiful with your descriptions in here. And then I felt like I wanted a description here too. And where was it? It was when she enters the room, I, I felt like, I don't know why, but I wanted, um, you just have, I follow her in and then you, you move on. And, and, um, I don't know. I felt like I was waiting. I was, I was expecting, some more descriptions there like I wanted to know you described the the outside of this house so well and leading up to it and just because you know also because this is I don't know it turned you know you're writing a ghost stories that like I I and and she's like a ghost hunter right like that's your main character so yeah she doesn't know it yet though the reader doesn't know Oh, but the character, I mean, the character is a, is a she's not a ghost hunter. Is this a di- different? She doesn't, she doesn't know yet either. She's going oh. to be, but, and I, I actually, I had to stop. I was, I'm going to back, go back and put it because introducing the house is just as introducing, uh, important as introducing the characters because the house is a character. Yeah, that, that's and what I, I kind of felt like that. Like I wanted more of a, descri- your, be- your beautiful descriptions <laughs> that you put into the surrounding area, right? Um, I wanted that for the house, right? Like her, like I wanted this kind of ominous feeling, even if she doesn't feel, or uh, the character might not know that it's haunted. Like, I don't know, like if we're just the place where she's going to be living and all of this, I wanted more of a sense of that. I felt like one good way that you can do that, Terry, is to, to, um, contrast it with where she's coming from so since she's moving into like she's walking into a massive victorian house um where where was she yesterday or earlier today like where is she moving out of and that would um like her whole you know something like my whole apartment would fit in this foyer or um you know like comparing where she came from to where she to the house could be a really good mechanism for Or getting the maybe. information we need about the house without it feeling like she like you have stepped all the way out of the story and like way like pulled the lens way back so that the um so that you can just say like this huge like chunk of of um description it would make sense for her to be comparing where she was or what she's used to to what she's walking into yeah and and um the I don't know something you might think you might include there too is like I don't know if uh I assume Maine probably has as many Victorian houses as as I think that's an East probably Coast even more general. probably oh, even yes. more um but I you know I know that like when I first came to uh visit my mom after she moved into her Victorian house uh, we're in distinct <laughs> thought that I had was like I'm gonna get lost in here and I did I remember I went to the bathroom and then I like couldn't find the first first like within the first five minutes of getting there I went to the bathroom and I came out and I didn't know like I didn't know how to get to the living room and each room is super separate from the rest of the house like every room is like (laughs) self-contained yeah Um, no open open door and there was just like a random staircase and (laughs) um there there's just like there was a fear of of of, uh, a house that size is going to be set up for servants like my house has a secret servant hair staircase in the kitchen <laughs> so you can get from the the servant quarters and the attic to the kitchen without like disturbing the family or making yourself seen and um that kind of thing is well you probably know terry you've probably been in victorian houses but um that's like something that 
uh, we're from the West and where like open floor plan ranch style houses are the thing. And that, that is not a Victorian house. But anyway, um, Lee, did you have any feedback? Um, I just, I found that I was sort of lost in it. I mean, I felt like where some writers, all of the information that you managed to convey in that little segment, I think some writers that would have come across as a massive info dump, but it didn't feel like that at all with you. I do mm. agree with Adrienne about wanting more um, about the house. Um, I think just because you'd said that it was so important in the story mm -hmm. and if it is so central I think that you need to make it seem bigger but your characters I, I warmed to straight away and I was sort of I want to know what happens to this character. Yes. Zach how about you? One of my favorite things about this, I love the description, I love how real you make it, but I think you do a really good job blending in there the character and the voice and just getting the, these relationships off strong right off the bat. And I think it really helps me get interested because I have someone to root for and I have that character conflict already. Teenage angst. You did a good job with that angsty teenager voice, Terry. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's Zach's favorite thing. It really is. It really is. <laughs> Zach loves some teenage angst. Excellent job, Terry. Do you have any, like, I don't know, anything um, that you particularly wanted feedback on on this part or anything that's been bugging you? Well, I was wondering, um, the way that I had the two, the first two um episodes set up the first episode is centered on her getting settled into the house because that's where a lot of things are going to be happening and then and then have the next episode her getting set up in this school um mm -hmm. and finding out some things this is going to kind of be the the um, inciting incident in the second scene because she's going to find out that she's got to do something or she's going to lose this scholarship that she had won previously um okay while she was a good student, her family life was great and she was participating, she's gonna find out quickly that she needs to do something differently. Um, and I was just wondering if that if that's okay or because the her friends in the high school are going to be a huge part of the story too. But I didn't feel like I could, I could jam all of it into one episode without feeling very crowded and rushed. Well, so it's, I am new to writing serial fiction too, but I've been doing some research and I, found that there's a five they call it a five act structure which I was like for a long time I'd heard that before and I was like I don't get it like how can there be five acts in a story <laughs> and also why would something that's shorter have so many more acts like almost twice as many acts as this novel and then I like looked deeper into it and I realized that um, the acts are actually sequences. So in Ninja Riders, we divide a story up into three acts and eight sequences. And um, a, a piece of serialized story, so a TV episode, like an hour long TV episode, like an episode of Veronica Mars or whatever, um, uh, which I know is a, an influence for or an inspiration for your story. Um, or a serial, you know, a chunk of serialized story has um, five sequences instead of eight. So it has fewer sequences and they're like defined, I, like they're sometimes called acts, but they're not, I don't know. The, to, it was easy for easier for me to wrap my brain around the idea that they are sequences. So um, like sequence one is, um, I wish I had my notes, up, but I'm trying to remember. Sequence one is like the, you know, the, um, the ordinary world, right? Um, and, and, but it's, it runs fast. You're not going to have as much ordinary world as you would in a novel because otherwise you'd have like an entire sequence that would just be ordinary world. And like, that's boring. So it's um, just one sequence. And then, and then there's only one conflict instead of two. And um, usually in a novel, you would have a midpoint and a main climax and here, you're just going to have one. Um, and I don't remember all five of them. I'll put them in the story notes, but um, you know, it ends with resolution. So you have to have like something 
that happens in this episode, but that I also the, the thing up that I can tell you the the um the five. What are they? You have um the inciting incident. Mm-hmm. And and then it asks for Act One scene. So like in, in Act One is pretty much just introducing the character and and the inciting incident. And then mm-hmm. two is rising action. So what are yes. the stakes? How will they be resolved? What does messing up look like? Um, what does success look like? So um, and then the lock in. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Act Three is the climax. Um, and the mid midpoint climax as part of act three and then act four is falling action and you touch on the dark night of the soul but you're not going to have like a full-on dark night of the soul in every episode of your story Um, but you are going to have like a dark moment that that then gets a little better and then act five is resolution right so so let me clarify the five act sequence that you just talked about that's in that that Thing that you worksheet us. the yeah. worksheet thank you that's what so in every episode you're going to have your inciting incident your rising action your climax for that falling episode. action resolution right but you're going to have an overall um inciting incident for the entire story right story so for arc. this book yeah. your inciting incident might be um something like overhearing something from the ants or like one ant leaves and the other one like what's going to happen next that could probably be your inciting incident but your overall inciting incident for the whole story is probably going to be her learning about the ghosts or whatever mm-hmm. and that might not be till episode three or something okay all you right know. that was conf- yeah that make that clears it up i know it's, I, it's, it's weird <laughs> like you it have- sounded like you had to have five episodes five episodes I- and that's it <laughs> no 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 it's um sequences in each episode um but the one thing that really struck me and I think I was talking to you Terry when I was like oh my god (laughs) because we were talking and you're like well you you're gonna have like a ghost of the week you know which is that's a a thing in serialized stories of this kind where like you're they're gonna have like a ghost story that they're gonna have for each episode we'll have a different ghost story but you're like I don't know what it, uh, it should be the overall ghost story and I was like oh my God, light bulbs popped off in my head because I thought it, the overall story does not have to also be a ghost story. And then often in this kind of book, especially if you already are going to have a love story, it's the romance that's the overarching. So like maybe your overall inciting incident is when Corey, Corey, right? That's her name? Yes. Yeah. Corey meets the boy who will be her love interest or girl, whatever, whatever is going to happen in your story. Um, if you have, cause I think you said there is a love story. There is. And there's even more than one boy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. But when she meets either both or one of those, like, that's the, like, so you're going to plot the entire season uh, as if it's a romance. And then inside each season, you're going to, or each episode, you're going to have a ghost story that will be plotted. I don't know that like, I was like blew my mind I was like oh my gosh because it's the same for my story right where I have this um faded love story Robin and Marion right and then but also this overarching story of you know good overcoming evil or whatever and so, so you five, have yeah a romance. Five, yeah sorry go ahead five what go ahead oh I was just gonna say you have this over art and it's really common if you think of um tv shows right where there is an overarching love story that actually is what brings you coming back and adrian loves supernatural that she watched it when it was brand new episodes but i have tried to go in and watch now where there's like five thousand episodes or something ridiculous and i can't do it i want to i like it but each episode is so self-contained and there's no and i just keep thinking to myself man one of these guys needs to get a girlfriend so that i have something that pulls me forward into the next episode it's, so it's not so self-contained that i feel done and then there's nothing the next time i want to watch tv to remind me oh i need to go see what happens there mm-hmm. so that was my big revelation of the last week or so was that holy crap the um like the the episodic storylines and the over or like the seasonal storylines do not have to be the same 
So then if she were going to use this, this worksheet to plan each of her episodes, like the, the lock-in and the midpoint climax and the dark night of the soul and the resolution, those would all pertain to the monster of the week. Well, she then this first episode doesn't sound like it has a monster of the week, right, but, Terry? But eventually you'll get there, but you have a few episodes that will be like introductory. Right. Yeah. That's so true. in this episode, the inciting incident is probably going to be um, something to do with her aunt Aggie um, and her uncle and, um, and, or something with the house or whatever, like this episode's story is um, this girl um, moving into a new house. So, you know, what's, what you, you need to have a story there. Otherwise it's just a scene, you know, like right. otherwise you just moved her in there. So um, you know, what happens to this house, it, it's probably going to be some indication that it's different, like that it's more than just a big house, like that there's a ghost there or something. So that might be the inciting incident is that she sees or hears or, or senses something. And then, um, you know, you're going to plot for that and leave like kind of a cliffhanger. And then she goes to school in the next episode. And then, you know, she meets people. And then maybe that's where the, um, like the romance storyline kicks off because she meets like boy number one or whatever, you know, and, but also um, it's going to move forward the, the, you know, towards the point where say episode three or four, you have your first ghost of the week. You just gave me the best idea. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. No, I can't Yay. wait. Yay. Yay. Okay, so are we ready to, are you ready to be edited? You feeling okay yes, about that? Yes, yes. Okay, Okay. so we're just gonna start at the beginning of Paranormal Times. And what I'm gonna do is read, and Terry has made me an editor here. And I'm gonna just, um, I have to go here to view and mode and suggesting. And I'm just gonna um, edit as I read. Okay, so they say, is this first italicized part going to be like an, um, what is that called, Zach, like at the top, an epigraph? Is it going to be an epigraph? Yeah. I don't know. I was, it, it's just, it's, you know, at the beginning of Twilight when she has her little speech and then the movie starts or and then the book starts. Uh -huh. it, it's just kind of like, yeah, her saying that. And then the, the story. So starts. I like. So that. I don't know what that is. I, I think it's like an epigraph. And um, so I would have a, um, like a, a, scene break of some kind even maybe a decorative like like that either a, have it like at the top before like then after that you would have like chapter one I have a yeah, note that'd be a full page break oh, yeah i have a note on that that that's like a it in it's a pretty big trope and like i think definitely in 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 tv shows right and what it is is it's like the girl journaling right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's, she's uh, writing in her, and that's like a journal, a journal entry. So you could maybe even just treat them like journal entries, right? Like give yeah. it a, give but it a have it be like its own little page. And then up prior to chapter one. So it would be an epigraph. Like where I, in my book, Viral Nation, I had like a presidential quote, and that would be like a head of where it says chapter one. Like it was at the top of the page. Right. Anyway, yeah. So I would my biggest thing here is so they say that some ghosts live in houses. I would do a, a, a paragraph break there. I say they can live inside of you, holding tight to your bones and squeezing your heart at the most uh, inopportune times. And the pro I would do three paragraphs. The problem okay. is, no matter how you try to move on, how you try to ignore the sadness, there is a part of your soul that squeezes back. Um, so this is a very long sentence and it takes a really long time to get to the best part, which is the last part. What I would do is say, and the problem is there is a part of your soul that soul that squeezes back. Are you kidding me? Hold on. That didn't work. Well, um, I'll just type it again. No matter how you try to move on no matter how you try to ignore the sadness i would do, do it you, like that do you need i don't know if we're allowed to if, if we're allowed to to ask sure. her what what but, is your question well i wondered if she needs both of those no matters like if she well, needs, not really yeah. it's actually pretty so to me 
the the part of here you don't need this comma if you take that how out. about no it matter how you try to ignore it and move on um so the part of this last paragraph that is the best for me is the problem is there's a part of your school the soul that squeezes back and um so we there's a, a editing thing i talk about a lot it's called resist the urge to explain which is in Renny Brown and Dave King's book, um, Self-Editing for Fiction Writers, which I highly recommend and we'll link to in the show notes here. Um, and what that is, is that all three of these sentences are very well written. There's nothing wrong with any, or even the way you had it as one sentence, like each of the three parts are really well written, but because there's three of them, they weaken each other. So mm -hmm. if you just had, and the problem is there, and the problem is there is a part of your, oh gosh, of your soul that squeezes back and cut all of this. It's, it's tighter and it hits harder. Okay. And, and so personally, that's what I would do. And because I don't think that you need those other two, there's nothing wrong with them. They're, they're well-written. The other two things, it's just that, um, um, they um they weaken the part that's the best which is that soul squeezing back if she so were to have... keep those two lines though too the also the issue that i was seeing is that they're kind of redundant right like i would just have well, no matter I'm how you try they're... to ignore the sadness you don't need the move on part you're explaining it to the reader in a way that doesn't need to be explained and so as a result it like each one of those three it's like separating the power or the punch of the thought into three parts so it's like a third each one is a third of the punch rather than one big like gut punch so then you would end up with they say that some ghost lives in houses and in fact yeah you could you can keep the word some or you could just say they say that ghosts live in houses but i don't know i like some they say that some ghosts live in houses i say they can live inside of you holding tight to your bones and squeezing your heart the most in opportune times and the problem is there's a part of your soul that squeezes back that hits much harder for me and i also um don't think you need the word some because um either that or i would say i say some of them so you would either use some in both or some in neither does that make sense terry yes i would either say they say that some ghosts live in houses i say that some of them live inside of you or just take out the word some up there yep i say they say that ghosts live in houses i say they they can live inside of you in fact you don't need the word can <laughs> i say they live <laughs> inside of you holding tight to your bones and squeezing your heart at the most inopportune times and the problem is there's a part of your soul that squeezes back do you see how much tighter that is i do i like that yes. yeah okay here we go we're here aunt ivy's voice pulls me up out of my well of despair and back into the tired old minivan that is delivering me to yet another place to stay i like that um that that is uh, place to say is capitalized. I think that's really good. Um, I think you could probably do a paragraph break there. I haven't been home in a year. There hasn't been a home for me to go to for, there hasn't been a home for me to go to for a year. Okay. So that's, um, slightly awkward. And I'm wondering if it couldn't be something like, um, I haven't, um, had a home for a year. And that, kind of says the same thing as these two sentences I haven't had a home for a year um you don't need the word well I I have a feeling well the word well is probably going to need to go on your um um <laughs> list of things to search for um mine is uh so I use the word so a lot but you have like well and but and and all in the same paragraph so what are those called um I wanted there's a name for that like conjunction or whatever that starts at the sentence and um just knowing what your your habit is of doing that is good because most of the time it's tighter if you take it out so I haven't had a home in a year Aunt Ivy and Uncle Walt tried I suppose but their house is small um and their own overachieving kids take up a lot of air um I really like that take up a lot of air so I think that um, just tightening it up a little bit. See, it lets that take up a lot of air, like breathe more. I take a breath and look out the window into a dreary 
cold cover, cloud covered evening. The sun has given up and sunk behind the trees, even though it's not uh, quite supper time. I know how it feels. I know how it feels. I'm a 16 year old girl who's totally given up on finding normal ever again. She's so melancholy. <laughs> um, uh, so this is gonna get 16 year old, I think is gonna get hyphens. I'm a 16 year old girl who has totally given up on finding normal ever again. That's telling. And I, I am gonna cut it and, and then let's see how it sounds without it because it's like t um, telling and then you're, you do a really good job in the rest of the scene of showing this. And the I'm reason I put that, oh. oh, go ahead. I was gonna say the reason I put that there is just because until that moment, you don't know that she's a 16 year old girl and I was trying to place her in people's heads. But I well, added so that as, a, as an afterthought. She lives with her aunt and uncle and she has to go live somewhere else. And so I think that it's clear enough that she's a teenager okay. or at least a child. And um, I think that you don't need to, um, like when she gets to school in the next episode, you know, we're going to know maybe that she's a junior. Yeah. Yeah. And I pretty much made the assumption that she was a teen. Yeah. Okay. So good. I don't think you need that there. Um, and I think it, what it does is, um, it tells something that you're going to show really, really well in a few minutes. So it's like giving it away before you've done it. So I think you can just say, I know how it feels. Um, and uh, yeah, we bounce up a long gravel driveway framed by giant green pines and wispy birch and ash trees whose colorful leaves are already dead on the ground. Um, are these does that make sense or does that make you think that the pine trees have lost their leaves because pine trees don't and i wasn't sure if that was confusing <laughs> right um no and i didn't think about it until you said so just now okay um you could it's a very long sentence though and you could yeah. um do just do like they're also uh or even just capitalize that and right and just so we bounce up a long driveway framed by giant pine trees and wispy birch and ash trees. Um, but I'm wondering, are there leaves um, on the ground like still colorful? Yeah, they, they, they turn color and then they fall. So. Right, but I, at least where I am, they like, once they fall, then they start to lose their color. But why not just capitalize the W and wispy and have that be, because the and kind of reads awkwardly. Like I, well, it, yeah, you would just need another verb in here. Um, why, what, why do you need an, another? Well, because um, then you have wispy birch and ash trees whose colorful leaves have, are, are already dead on the ground. Like you're just. Well, yeah, you might need to. The subject of the sentence is the trees um, and they're described real well. Oh. My husband is in here trying to make the bed while I'm sitting in it and you have to stop. I'm on a web call. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, wispy birch and ash trees. Um, okay, I know. Um, you know, you uh, you could do this. Have already dropped their colorful leaves on the ground, or yeah, no. If you take out the the and, it's like if you leave and in there. Hold on, then you're borrowing the. Um, the framed uh like then you're like kind of borrowing the the verb from the sentence ahead of it and if you leave um uh, if you don't take you have and in there um you need a verb so and wispy birch and ash trees do what right um you could say wispy birch and ash trees um have already dropped their colorful leaves but you lose that dead on the ground so i would just put capitalize the and could you just say wispy wispy birch and ash trees colorful leaves are already dead on the ground like just get rid of whose um you could but i don't like it as much wispy birch and ash trees colorful well you'd need to um i don't know you could decide how to do that Terry, um, but I, yeah. I think I would, or you can just keep it um, as one sentence. Um, but 
it then you have that problem of, well i didn't it didn't occur to me that you that um i i um because you have the word who's i would just leave it one sentence let's leave it there at the crest of the hill the trees okay you need a comma right there i think at the crest of the hill the trees open up into an expanse of greenish brown grass dotted with boulders and what might be bird feeding stations um i can't see much in the failing light so this um personally i would just say and bird feeding stations because um i found myself when you were reading it the first time um like pulled out to think about how does she know their bird feeding stations at all if she can't see them because um what the heck is a bird feeding like if you just say dotted with boulders and bird feeding stations i'm just imagining there are some bird houses but if like she kind of thinks of bird feeding stations, but she can't see them. Then I find myself thinking about what is she exactly seeing and what else could they be in that much, like stuff like that. So I would just do dot with boulders and bird feeding stations. Um, Beyond is a monster of a Victorian mansion. I would definitely break this up into two sentences. The kind with steep gabled roofs, towers and balconies, a rounded front porch, all decorated with stained glass and woodwork you might find on a gingerbread house. Um, I think pretty much everyone knows gingerbread houses are a Christmas thing, so you can cut that. Um, and also you could even make it a little tighter if you just do any ginger, um, gingerbread woodwork. Um, and then you can't, you can cut like you might find um, and the reason I would do that, Terry, is because she's like in this kind of pit of despair. And so she might not be so eloquent. You know what I mean? Okay. Yep. Um, and you have, I know this house, not that I've ever been here. And that is another like instance of telling what you're about to show in the very next sentence. So I would cut that. Morgan Manor is where my mother grew up with her sisters and their mother before them. And right on back, traceable to shortly after the founding of Freeport itself in 1789. I would make that its own paragraph and that does a really good job of showing, well, it's still telling, but it, it tells the same thing as this, but in a better way that gives us information that we need. A sea captain named Morgan Sterling built it as a gift for his new bride. I don't know why they call it Morgan Manor and not Sterling Manor. Maybe the captain, um, I would take out it was possessive and just say maybe the captain didn't want um, his any of his family to be able to lay claim to it. Um, and then I would have I would break some of this up, I think. Not that it matters. He died after it was built, a year after it was built, and then his wife died of a broken heart. No, I would put that up there and break it right here. My great, great, whatever great grandparents bought it for a song and kept it in the family ever since i would say and it's been in the family because her great 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 grandparents did not keep it in the family um because they, they died right um so the her family has kept it in the family but i would say my great, -great oh i see what you mean yes. grandparents bought it for a song and it's been in the family ever since yeah um so I, when I got to this part, when you read in 1999, everything fell apart, I was like, is it still in the family? Um, so I think that um, like you, what you might do is my great, great, whatever, great, that is such your voice right there. Just by the way, the great, great, whatever, great grandparents is, is um, your author voice coming through nice and strong. And I love it. Um, bought it for a song. I would hear that sentence that part, that description of her grandparents, great whatever grandparents, and I would know this was your story no matter what, because that's <laughs> that's like your voice. So good job there. Thank My you. great, great, whatever great grandparents bought it for a song and it's been in the family ever since. Um, uh, like, even though, maybe I would do even though, um, something like this, even though ev oops, everything, fell apart in 1999 so that the reader is not sitting there wondering like what fell apart was it the house was it um you know or not the house but like it I had a feeling like wait did, did they not have the house anymore or do they not own it anymore or what's going on um so I would 
put that up there, like have that as a, son, a paragraph. My great, great, whatever great grandparents bought it for a song and it's been in the family ever since, even though everything fell apart in 1999. That year, my grandmother and grandfather died. The, um, and then I, instead of that, the year I would put that year, um, if you're gonna have the 1999 up above, I think that year, my mother and sisters decided they would rather, um, so I would not, I, you don't need to split up and stop being family. They mean the same thing. And I like stop being a family better than split up in myself, but just choose one. So you can either have my mother and her sisters decided they would rather split up um, instead of trying to talk out their differences or stop being a family um, instead of trying to talk out their differences. One or the other will be stronger. Personally, I, I like stop being a family, so I'm gonna leave there. Um, and it, you also don't need, instead of, I, you can just use than, they would rather than, right? Um, so they would rather stop being a family than, than try. That gets rid of an ing verb too, which is almost always a good thing. Uh, they would rather stop being a family than try to talk out their differences. And then I would do almost like a list, right? We moved to Vermont, Aunt Ivy moved to Powell Aunt Powell yeah, so here's a problem we have here is that I don't know where Palinol is and you have a state and then I'm assuming that's a city. Oh, it is. It's a town next to Freeport in Maine. Yeah. Okay. So moved I to the next to town say, over. Yeah, one they moved one town over yeah. to Palinol. Well, however you say Pownall. that. <laughs> Palinol. And Aggie stayed at the manor. And I lost the entire side of my heritage. So you see how that, that becomes like kind of a list. Yeah. And I think that that works really well. So, and it also makes these important points of where everybody went, like really stand out in the readers for the reader. Like it indicates this is important. It's important to know that they, who went or stayed where. So we moved to Vermont and Ivy moved, um, whoops, one town over to Palinol. Aunt Aggie stayed at the manor and I lost an entire side, um, entire side, or what do you think about half? I lost an entire half of my heritage. I don't know. I always thought of heritage as two-sided. You've got your mom and you've got your dad. So that's why I said okay. half, but I don't know. No, you said side. Okay. I'll leave it side. I lost an entire side of my heritage. My, um, my mind clears of the driving fuzz as the minivan pulls to a stop bothered by sudden silly fear so that bothered that sounds like the minivan is scared yeah. <laughs> uh, yes um so what i would do is say like i would start with the minivan, the minivan. pulls to a stop and um, my mind clears um so does it clear or is it bothered by a sudden and I you know is she bothered by a sudden silly fear she is so it's not being her mind is actually not even cleared anyway right so the mini well, pulls yeah. to stop and I'm bothered by a sudden silly fear um okay I think what you're getting at is that her mind clears of these kind of um melancholy thoughts and then and then it's hit with the fear but it doesn't um that's a complex, maybe more complex um, series of events for one sentence <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because it, it does read like the minivan has a sudden silly fear, <laughs> even though we know better. Um, yeah. And it also that, that um, when you, when you fix it so that it, it, the, you know, you'd have to flip the first and second part of this three part sentence and um, to make it so that it's her mind that is hit by a sudden silly fear and not the minivan. And then um, you end up having her mind clearing and being hit by a sudden silly fear at the same time. Right. So, you know, you could say the, my mind clears of the, of the driving fuzz as the minivan pulls to a stop and then a blank and or a period. And then you would have something like, and then I'm bothered by, you need to have like, like this is the next thing. And it, that's not there. Like the words that indicate this is the next thing. Right. Um, but personally, I don't think you need the driving fuzz because I, um, it took me a minute to realize like what that might be. And I, and it pulled me out a little bit, like not 
a ton, but I think the minivan pulls to a stop and I'm bothered by a sudden silly fear is, um, is uh, good. I'm gonna leave it like this. Obviously you can decide what you want to do, but just know that sentence is, I think the thought that you have there is too complex for one sentence. It at least needs to be two sentences and you need words that indicate like first her mind cleared and then it, then it was bombarded with this thought or bothered with this thought. I haven't ever spoken to my aunt, haven't even met her. What if I'm not welcome? Um, I'm also gonna say that you could just cut, um, like you could cut all of this here and just have, I haven't, you know, like you don't need to tell us that she has a fear and then show us the fear. You could just give us the fear. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. Do you have a little bit of a habit of, of um, telling something and then turning around in the very next sentence and showing it with like, so this, I haven't ever spoken to my aunt. It's not, she's not speaking and it's not dialogue, but it's internal monologue. So it's, it reads like dialogue to the reader. Mm -hmm. And so that means that dialogue almost always is showing. So you showed us how her fear, like the next sentence after you tell us that she has one. Okay. And it also doesn't read like a particularly silly fear. She hasn't ever spoken to her aunt. She hasn't met her. What if she's not welcome, right? Yeah. Um, I hope that you're going to tell us at some point why she can't live with her other aunt anymore. Yeah, that's a big part of the story. Okay. So I haven't ever, so Aunt Yagi stayed at the manor and I lost an entire side of my heritage. I haven't ever spoken to, um, I actually would say her name here to um, Aunt Aggie, I haven't ever met her. What if I'm not welcome? As if I care. See, that's really good. Um, still, my voice sounds childish when I say, are you sure Aunt Aggie doesn't mind me coming, my coming to stay? Um, I think that this does not, I had this thought when you were reading that um, this is not a particularly childish sounding sentence. <laughs> and you could make it more childish sounding so that she's like, cringing at herself right she's got like a cringiness if you say um like what if aunt aggie doesn't um want me to stay right mm -hmm. or something along that yeah. line and um, that sounds more childish it's something along okay. those lines are you sure aunt aggie won't mind that seems like a rather grown-up like even almost adult um way of phrasing what like it doesn't sound childish you actually have to tell me that her voice sounds childish because it's not in the dialogue does that make sense yes yeah so if you change it to something along the lines of what if aunt aggie doesn't want me to stay that sounds more childish i wait for aunt ivy to make me feel better of course she's happy to have you your family right but instead she clears her throat and shrugs i would move this up and let that be a beat for this dialogue it doesn't matter hun the courts ordered it i bite back a sigh and try to sound to find the positive wait um, can i ask you a question so you would you mm -hmm. would not make it doesn't matter hun its own paragraph even though it's dialogue right it would go so but instead she clears her throat and shrugs is a beat that attaches okay. to that dialogue. So they both I see. want okay. Ivy and I would put them together. Yep. Uh, but I do think that you have, do you have your bag? I'm pretty sure is Ivy's dialogue. Oh, it is. Yeah. That's yeah. Be. So um, yep. you have, do you yep. have your bag? She tries to find the positive and then um, you either need to just cut that or I'm going to leave you a note. Like we need to see what, that looks like so like you need to either expand this and give us what her positive is like how is there a positive in that I don't know I um, don't even remember writing that maybe yeah. just I bite back a sigh <laughs> yeah yeah um so or that so either take away the positive part that part of the sentence or yeah. um you could cut that whole paragraph and just put, do you have your bag after the courts ordered it, which is, would be kind of uh, interesting because it would mean that she says the courts ordered it. And then she just goes on, like, it's no big deal that the courts ordered it. Right. Right. Yep. So the, like the reader would read that, like, it would be kind of like, there's not even a pause, like, oh my God, whatever. Um, and then you could, in that case, you could cut this whole paragraph with the sigh and the finding the positive. Mm-hmm. So um, 
yes. I clutched the green canvas messenger bag like a lifeline. Um, I would say um, my my green canvas messenger bag like a lifeline. It's faded and torn on one seam with an ACDC patch covering another rip on the front. It was my dad's. I love that description. Love it. Aunt Ivy takes a breath and holds it in for a second as if stealing herself for this next bit. Then she exhales and turns off the van at the same time. Um, so I'm going to cut as if stealing herself for this next bit because um, I don't get the idea that um, um, Corey knows Ivy super well and and we're not in, I, it reads a little bit like um, getting into Ivy's point of view, I think. Um, so you can just say Aunt Ivy takes a breath and holds it for a second. Then she exhales and turns the van at, off the van at the same time, which is a good job of showing that stealing herself it's there without you telling us, I think. Okay. And then I would say, um, I would do this. Um, okay. You know, she says, let's go. Um, this is a little bit too long and too important to be a beat. It reads like more than a beat. So I would have another paragraph there. Um, but you do need to say who's saying it. So I would just do a tag in the middle there. And the reader reads like very linear, linearly from left to right, right? So if you say, okay, she says, it's like, okay, let's go. Rather than, okay, let's go if it's all together. Does that make sense? The, the beat like, or the tag reads in the mi reader's mind when they're hearing the dialogue um, in their mind's ear, it reads like an actual break. So it, it, break, it controls the pacing of the dialogue. Okay. This the uh, I would say the porch stairs or the porch steps because um, I don't know just so we know she's not in the house yet. Yeah. Um, creek as we climb, alternating wind chimes and hanging planters full of dead flowers sway back and forth in the warm yellow glow of the porch light. Oh, that's why mm -hmm. I took the first porch away. Yeah. Oh, how about front? Oh yeah, that's good. Front stairs, or I actually think of them as steps. So I'm going to put steps because stairs to me is like a staircase inside. And I bet you there's going to be one. Yep, that makes <laughs> um, so sense. The front <laughs> steps creak as we climb, alternating wind chimes and hanging planters full of dead flowers sway back and forth in the yellow, warm yellow glow of the porch light. And Ivy again pauses, her hand raised before. So I'm just going to take out again because we cut out the... Um, other pause. I don't know. I just gonna. I don't think you need again because you didn't say pause earlier. Um, even though it was a pause. Aunt Ivy pauses, her hand raised before grabbing the brass knock door knocker and banging three times. We wait. After what seems like forever, I count the peeps of some long. Uh, some. So here was weird. It seems like she waits forever and then she counts the peeps. And I think that while she's waiting, right? Yeah, she's counting yeah. the peeps. So um, I wonder if you couldn't say I count the peeps of some lone bug or frog out in the woods while we um, wait for what yeah. seems sure. like forever. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the door opens when I reach 13 to reveal. So here I um, is where I got a little lost because um, Corey is not seem very old. And so um, an older woman, this is her aunt, right? Her mother's sister is her mother, like either was old when she was born or she's way younger than her sisters. Oh, you know, that's actually a really good point because in my, I, I know I said that they were sisters in my mind, Aunt Aggie is actually her great aunt. So that's actually a really good save. Hmm. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave you a note yeah, um, I'm gonna have to go back and adjust make that. Make sure it's clear. These are her grandma's sisters. Yeah. Um, that's gonna need to be made more clear up front because I yeah. found myself thinking, why does her aunt look like her grandmother? <laughs> um, yeah. An older woman with shoulder length, white hair. Um, I would, instead of wearing, I would just say, she wears a pair, like two sentences, I think. She wears a pair of ripped jeans and a loose top. And a loose, so you can say, um, oh, I, you can say a loose top with blue, green, and purple sw swirls. Um, mm -hmm. Just, it's a little tighter, I think. Uh, the wood 
screen door winds as she pushes it open to lean against the door frame. She looks Ivy up and down. Um, so I would um, do you break that up there and make this you've got you got old um, instead of having a, a tag and an adverb there. I would put put it up with the beat of she looks Ivy up and down. You got old. Ivy stiffens. You'll always be older. I love that. They square off for a moment like stray dogs. And I wonder if I should step back or get trampled in the fight. Um, but Aggies, so it sounds like, you know, that works, but Aggie's face suddenly softens into a smile that deepens the creases by her eyes. I think around her eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Around her eyes. She steps forward and hugs Ivy. Who says long time no see, sis? Aggie Aggie. does. Yeah, so I'd move that up there. Long time no see, sis. I feel like um, this is going to be capitalized. Like, I know if you just had mom like that, like a name, it would be capitalized. So I think it would be capitalized. Mm -hmm. Ivy returns the embrace, gripping tightly before stepping back and holding up one hand towards me, like I'm what she brought for show and tell. Yeah. Then here's a, this is a good beat. She sniffs and her eyes suddenly bright. Well, and here's Corey. Um, Aunt Aggie turns her sea green eyes to me, looking me over from my whip straight brown hair to my worn high top Nikes. Nikes is definitely going to be a capital. Um, I got a little caught up in her con- saying whip straight brown hair because um, I was like, does she straighten it? Like, why is she thinking about how straight her hair is right now? Um, so I think I would take out, it's the whips, the word whip that that caught me up. I think you can just say from my straight brown hair down to my worn high top Nikes. Um, because otherwise I, I got pulled out a little bit wondering why she's having such a descriptive thought of her hair at this moment. We're very tight in the moment, like very close perspective. And so um, it pulled me out a little bit because I thought what an odd description or time for her to be thinking about that. And I also really wanted to know whether she straightens her hair, if it's really that straight. <laughs> and I don't think that's a thought that like we need to have right then, you know? Yeah, um, so I'm going to cut it. You can decide. Mm-hmm. I actually don't mind the, just the word. I think it's an interesting way to describe straight hair. I just don't think she would be describing her own hair like that right that minute. Mm-hmm. Her expression is almost hungry as it settles back on my face. I want to reach up to see if I have something stuck there. You look just like your mother. Thanks. I replied lamely, like I had anything to do with how I look. Come on in. The moving company delivered your luggage earlier. It's in your room. I follow her in. Ivy hesitates on the doorstep. Aggie turns. Um, so instead of hesitates, which indicates that she's going to actually um, come in, I would say stays or something more permanent. Because if she's just hesitating, maybe Aggie would say, will you come in instead of you won't? Like she's accusing her. And so I think it, she needs to, it needs to be more like she's planted there and she's not on the verge of coming in, which is what hesitate seems to say, you know? Mm-hmm. So I would say she stays on the doorstep. Aggie turns, you won't come in for a m- minute. That's like a, Aggie turns is a beat for this pair, this dialogue. Ivy looks away. Um, I would put that up there. I can't, Walter and the kids. I would put that up. Actually, what I would do is um, put this like I can't. Ivy looks away. Walter and the kids are expecting me for supper. Okay. Is that disappointment in their voices? Now that's odd considering considering the family has been fighting for years. Can I um, talk to you out here though before I go? Um, So you didn't read the word though. I was just going to put like you skipped it but I do think you need it so I was gonna say you might like want to cut it but I don't think so I think you need it um and I think you need to say who says this Uh, Ivy asks Aunt Aggie nods and ushers me inside um I would change like I Corey go on in is a little awkward phrasing I think I think I would do go on in Corey like that sounds more natural to me 
go on inquiry. The kitchen is down the hall. There are some cookies on the counter. She pulls the screen door closed between us and turns away. Instead of going to find cookies, I linger in the foyer and eavesdrop shamelessly. I don't hear much, just snatches of whispered conversation. Not a good idea. Already senses it. Can't be sure. Um, I would probably um, do... Like you have an M dash and then also ellipses and I would um, be consistent. I kind of like the ellipses better than the M dash. So mm -hmm. not a good idea, already senses it can't be sure. And one sharp retort from Aunt Aggie, which I would put that up there. I won't let it. There's a silence for a moment. There's silence for a moment then a flurry of motion. Uh, I do a paragraph break there. I pull my messenger bag over my shoulder and hurry down a hallway lined in pictures hung on dark blue wallpaper decorated with swirling flower vines and birds. That's a mouthful. It is, but better get to the kitchen before they realize I'm listening. So maybe before I get caught listening, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. That would, you know, think about what is what would worry her, like that they care, like she's up very much like I don't care she doesn't want to get in trouble either yeah. <laughs> so yeah. she would be more worried about being caught than by hurting their feelings or whatever yep uh, I pull my messenger bag over my shoulder and hurry down the hallway um I think you could break it up right it's lined in with I think it's lined with <laughs> pictures hung on dark blue wallpaper decorated with swirling flower vines and birds um you know, you might say the picture, you can bring this back around, right, to the beginning if you say something like the pictures um, must, con you know, contain that missing half, or I can't remember what you said, part, half, no, what did you say? Side, side. Side of my heritage. Of my heritage. Right. Yeah. And so that, that we get a reason. So rather than just being a random description, which is beautifully written, by the way, and I can Thank really you. picture it, we get a reason why she's thinking, look, paying attention to them right now as she's hurrying. And it's because here's that heritage that she's missing, that she's been yeah. missing. Yeah. And this is actually the moment where she's going to get kind of caught up in looking at the house and seeing its energy and you'll get that good description. As yeah, walks, you could so. even if you wanted to do a little more there, you could saw, um, let me get back down there. You could actually like right here, you know, I stop, you know, have her yeah. right yeah. here, you could have her stop and look at maybe a picture that looks like her, but isn't her mother, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then hear something that um, brings on the next paragraph which is like so then she hears like a, a door banging shut or whatever or actually it's not i <laughs> i can't tell you You'll, no no yeah. don't tell me but you know something that like gets her to move on from looking at that pair that yep. photograph um so you could have you know it, it this something along those lines like where she's looking at these photos and she's seeing um this whole family line and it's and she's seeing herself in them and that could be really cool mm -hmm. did all of that make sense do you have any questions or anything no that was great i really appreciate it um now i want to go right <laughs> <laughs> so job. yay it worked Our job is, oh, is um, <laughs> um awesome so yay that was fun and next week um is going to be i think um lee's turn right lee yeah. is going to um, yeah. be in the spotlight hot seat next time um did any of you guys have any questions about terry's edit like did that all make sense to everybody mm -hmm. Yeah, it made sense. I think it was a good. I want to. I'm going to preface. Up, we're good. I'm gonna preface. So I'm going to re retroactively preface Terry and also anyone listening that um, I don't ever want to change your voice. Like you have a voice that's very strong, in particular, Terry. And so um, my suggestions are just suggestions. And sometimes, like I try pretty hard to tell you why I'm making the suggestion so that you can 
find a way to get the same thing done. Like I show you how I would do it, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the only way to do it. And you definitely, my way might not be the best because I have a, for in particular, thinking about the difference between me as a writer and you as a writer is I have a much tighter voice than you. Like my, I tend to be much, um, uh, less descriptive. I, description is not my, um, <laughs> my strong suit and it is a 100% yours. So I have a lot more in dialogue and less in, in, um, descriptive, you know, so if I, you know, sometimes I might tighten something up more than works for your voice and it's totally okay to just take the spirit of the suggestion and then use your, you know, write it in, in the way that is totally your voice. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Like, like cause you do have a, a particularly strong, like I, I have heard, I've been working, Terry's been in um, my Wednesday night workshop for two years <laughs> and um, I have heard lots of her work and work, you know, workshopped it. And she, there, you just have this voice that I would recognize anywhere. Like I, I, if I read something that was yours, I would be like, oh, that's it. Either that's Terry's or Terry needs to read this because this person writes like her. Um, well, you know, I, I think I started recognize. writing like that out of self-defense because when I first started writing, every feedback that I got was your characters are sitting in space. You need to do something about that. So well, you did, so. you did, you mastered it because your setting is your absolute strong suit and descriptive writing. And for the record, I think um, we talk a lot about writer archetypes and ninja writers. Um, I'm a teacher writer, 100%, like almost entirely. I think Lee is probably a teacher writer as well. And I think the other three of you guys are artists. <laughs> I think Terry is likely an artist teacher. Um, Adrian also an artist teacher and Zach is like pretty much 100% an artist writer right yes. Zach yes, yeah yeah really. and um, so that that real beautiful lyrical flowy um, uh, descriptive writing is like the hallmark of a uh, artistic fiction writer um, so I don't know if that have you if you've taken the archetype test if that rings true to you but my my guess is that um you are an artist writer who has a good amount of teaching like a teacher side as well which is why you yeah. want us to know about the house or the hair you know like all of these things that that's the teacher side coming out but that real flowy beautiful descriptive writing is super artistic <laughs> and is not <laughs> I have like zero artist writer in me and I don't do that very well so I learn a lot from yours because I have to I have to make it happen it doesn't just like come out of me very well <laughs> <laughs> Lee would you say you're a teacher writer I feel like you are but I'm curious what you think um a bit I think you've said that I'm a spiller writer before now spiller I think you're a spiller and a teacher somewhere either a spiller teacher or a teacher spiller but I it seems to me like you like you tell these stories that are very um spiller like but also you want people to understand why hmm. yeah like why um why something is important but yeah you definitely um are a spiller teacher I um yeah but definitely the other three are are artists <laughs> um anyway that's all I've got I think we're done you guys are amazing thank you for being like I'm super excited that we have the serial killer crew this is gonna be fun and we're gonna get better at doing these calls <laughs> it'll be a little shorter um but thanks everyone who's listening for hanging out with us and we'll see you next week